Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix Online meeting 226, last one of 2021 on the next to last day going on. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, as always, these meetings are recorded for those of us that uh, aren't here right now with us chatting in the real time. We have Ron. I don't know. We've lost Jacob. He might be off uh, doing holiday things, stuff like that, uh, getting ready for the New Year's. I don't know. We'll see. That's tomorrow. Today is the 30th. What are we doing? We'll do triage. I don't think we're going to take long to get through uh, triage, uh, So, but we'll do that. And then we will uh, jump over to the pull request. Sean has a couple that he'd like to walk through, so we'll do that. And then a quick reminder that we will be moving to YouTube in the next meeting, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Just reminders. Nothing new there. Um, Let's see. I think that's it. And then we'll take questions, comments, things people want to talk about. So let's go ahead and jump over to the website, and we'll do triage. Uh, Bob, you ready for triage? And then Sean, warm up, because your pull request will be right after that. Ready? <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. So um, I'm still digging through the authentic code signature discussion, so I just want to hold on to this for two weeks. I will be ready in two weeks. I've, I just haven't had enough time to get all the way to it. I was running down. Uh, some build process things that I really wanted to understand and fix that in the end is it's working now in Wix 4. We're moving forward, but I'm not thrilled with what I did not learn there. Anyway, I'll be back on the Athena Code signature uh, in two weeks and with uh, my research from that, which I think says that we have two issues here, and both are from Sean and both are tracking, um, I guess, intermittent integration failures. I don't know if I've seen these myself. So it seems to only happen when I push to my own branch, my own repo. <laughs> oh. Like In both of these have happened on builds on my repo I when see. I was just synchronizing develop for me, but whatever. Hmm. That's fascinating. I don't know what would be different about yours. You're getting a different set of machines than we are. <laughs> um. Maybe. This know. might be a really short triage. What do you want to do with both of these, Sean? Um, I know you didn't want to lose them, but what do we do with them going forward? Probably the same thing that you did with your uh, random test failures. Put them in four and then wait and see if I, they happen more often and yeah, take a swing later. All right. So uh, are these going to you then? I guess. I mean, I'm not going to look at them. So. <laughs> All right. So we'll see where they end up at the end of four and then probably close them if we don't. Well, unless we see them more regularly. Yeah. All right. Um, might be Might be a good thing just to mention that these are in, that you've not seen these in the Wix board and only seen them in your repo your repo. I, I know you're pointing to your repo there, but um, just another data point that we don't lose that. Um, yeah, and this is the same sort of thing. Yeah, I've, I've had failures, you know, that theoretically couldn't happen, um, and they went away on a rerun. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for what it's worth. Well, I mean, it's, it's not clear to me that, that yeah, you know, what's I don't know. It, it's I think it's open. It's like you know these are the machines we've seen. You know they're they have limited disk space. Um, hopefully that's not a real problem, but maybe it is. Not I, I I wouldn't blame these things on that, but yeah. No. Maybe I don't know. All right. It's well. Weird. We'll keep looking. I mean, it's it's also possible that people hit these in the wild, and it's just an intermediate failure in burn somewhere. I, I'm I haven't looked at this error code. I haven't looked at any of it. It's just kind of like, yeah, the uh, elevator process was lost here. So maybe it's a matter of, well, if this happens more often, then it's a, maybe it's a matter of going. All right. So what do we do in that case? Do we throw another elevation prompt and try to launch it again? I don't know. I don't. Don't have an answer there. I don't know. Yep. All right. Well, we'll we'll keep those around as Wix four goes along. See if any more instances of them pop up. People can go ahead and mention that they hit them on whatever build they're on, and we can uh, 
see how uh, how much accrues to those uh, issues to know if we really need to go hunt them down or if they're just one-hit wonders that, you know, you know, hopefully, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about one-hit wonders. Like, well, somebody hit it. Something hit it. So we'll see. All right. So let's go jump over to pull requests. Sean, you wanted to talk about, I assume, these three. Uh, which one do you want to start with? Um, I guess let's do the files in use one first. That should be Six, short. Uh, number 67. Yeah, 6348. Yeah. Too many numbers on the screen to choose from. Um, where do you want to go? So I ended up, like, it looks like in V3, you guys tried to unify this files and use messages to where the BA would just get one right. and they could just re return whatever they, the return code and it would do the right thing. But yeah, as we found out with .NET Framework, that doesn't work. So I chose to just break them up and then it, the engine is not, it's still sending the same message but it's sending the source of the files in use so that the BA can know what it's supposed to return. Because we can't unify the two things. Okay. And NetFX and then, has its own because that's the protocol for um, NetFX? It, yeah, I mean, they have their yeah. own documented return code. So it's basically yes, no, retry, cancel. Got it. Right, and that's because you can set the protocol to NetFX and we'll talk to it. Right. Yeah, okay. Got it. So that's these types, which then come back to the message. Yeah, that's passed in the execute files and use message. Yep. So you have the same data, you just have to re respond differently. Right. Where do we put the responses, the allowed response, or the expected responses? So I guess that's the other part of the change is that we just pass the BA's response back to the source. Yep. So they have to look at the documentation for MSI or the net, of, net framework to see what they're supposed to return. Which is what this documentation is pointing out. Yeah. So like, for example, I was trying to write an integration test where it locks a file and then it unlocks it after getting the files in use and does a retry and try to make it go away. But I couldn't figure out how to make it go away under Restart Manager. It would keep on returning the same thing even though I unlocked the file. So that's why I kind of just want to let the BA just decide what they want to return, and then they'll have to know what the right behavior is. Because you're saying there's no real good way to unify across these. Um, no this documentation so that Burn can essentially apply a mux to them and say, well, if it's this one and this one, come out with this answer. Yeah, I'd, at least for me, I can figure out how it's supposed to work to where, like, you know, if Burn starts doing that, then if we got it wrong, we'd have to update it. Right. Or if they add a new return code or something, we'd have to update burn for a BA to be able to get take advantage of that. No, that's going to happen. Probably not. But... Mm -hmm. No, yeah. not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's a, a security bug in it, it's not going to change. Um, or if .NET Core fails and they have to go back to .NET Framework. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is this right here is probably the biggest part of the change. Then is that you have to read the documentation to handle all the different kinds of error messages. So it used to well, all right. So NetFX is going to send its own things, 
MSI and MSI Restart Manager have that fallback behavior, right, where they switch back and forth between each other? Only if you return retry. Right. Well, that's not exactly true. Yeah, there was not... a. You yeah, certain return codes will cause a normal files in use to be sent afterwards. Right. Yeah, I don't. So I'm... I don't know if there's a better solution to this other than, I and mean, we could put something in, in, in like, ball util to do the interpretation to try to put. If we want to try to get the muxer, we could put something in ball util, right? So then at least you know, it wouldn't be in burn, and they could have something to help them do the right thing. Because presumably everybody wants to do the same thing, right? If you get a files in use, return retry so many times after doing whatever you can do in your UI. It's the remediation that's going to be bundle specific. Right. But in the end, after it, remediation, it, yeah, there should be common behavior. Ideally. So you, is there a way that you can, it, is there a single code you can return that always does retry from all these? Well, I mean, you can send retry. Does it behave like, the same? On, is there a code that will behave the same across all of them? I mean, not exactly, because if you return retry to restart manager, you're going to get a normal files in use message after that. And then, like I was trying to say, I don't understand what the behavior is supposed to be, because I could never get a retry to, as far as I could tell, retry didn't actually refresh anything with the restart in manager. the restart manager case yeah uh, restart manager essentially is like saying hey do you want me to take care of this for you not hey do you want me to go check again and see if i actually need to stick around is maybe what they're doing yeah okay so like if you if you wanted a retry with restart manager you'd have to know that you need to send a retry to the normal files in use that comes right after that. Yeah, if they, if they send retry, then retry again, and then restart manager maybe will refresh its stuff, or maybe not. Maybe I wasn't, maybe it has to do with how you're locking the file or whatever, but I was returning retry to both and it wasn't working. It was still saying the file was in use. So there's like an interplay between the MSI restart manager messages and the normal files and use messages yes. that right. you can't use a single muxer to take care of. It'd have to do more than just have to convert remember. one return code into another. You'd have to remember state across calls. Yeah. Yeah. The, the challenge is everybody's going to want to do the same thing. Right. Everybody's like, presumably people are just going to want to have the retry button or the ignore button, essentially. Well, I mean, you ended up convincing that other contributor not even to have a retry button in the standard VA UI and V3. Yes. Yes. And I'm, I'm absolutely, because trying to get the thing working in V3 is going to be challenging because we didn't provide enough data. Um, I was hoping we could put something in ball util that could say, yeah, here's the here's the retry restart. And I it's sounding like it's just hard to do that. Or impossible. Well I mean I guess you could add like a property in the base BA, like, you know, enable default files and use behavior. And then it will respond to the messages however you want it to. Yeah, I mean, not the first time. Yeah, that's. I mean, this is good because we're providing more information so that you can make the right decision. And then I was just trying to, 
let's go with this. The thing that I'm asking for is actually on top of this, which is the, uh, could we provide a helper function somewhere to do the right thing since we probably know more about it than anybody else? And if the answer is, ah, that's too much effort for right now, that's fine. Um, but I, I agree with you when you said, let's not put it into burn engine. I think that makes a lot of sense. So the burn engine is just going to provide the data. I think this is all good. The question is, do we go one step further and go, and by the way, here's probably the default handling you want for these scenarios. I guess that, that would be the next thing on top. I mean, probably just build it into the standard BA and then people could, would copy it. Yeah, it's that or put it in volutal, right? Whichever way is easier. Right, I mean, you need layers. UI. What's that? You need you need UI to do the right thing. You can't put UI in volume. You know? True. No, I was just trying to get the the calculate based off the inputs. But what UI do you need? I was just trying to get at the you know here, here's the standard calculation. You feed in these pieces of information, and it gives you back the standard answer for retry. Right, you feel it feed in the type, whatever thing you got, the count, some I don't, I don't know what else, right? Anything that we could that we needed to, and you fed in this machine and it came back with the right answer for a retry, for example. That would be interesting. Um, but we can design that because I think now we have the data where before, like you said, things were being eaten and burned because it's trying to be smarter than it could, or being too smart and hiding data. Right? Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool, cool. Anything else on the um, this one, on the deunified files and use messages? No, that one should be good to go then. Yep. It's all green. Go back. There we go. Uh, too far. Uh, the UI is updating very slow. OK. Um, which so one do you want to do? Number 50, the 3421. Reinstall packages were uninstalled during failed upgrade bundle. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, this yeah, so one's fun. So if you remember, we're trying to solve the issue where you upgrade a bundle, where the upgraded bundle is doing major upgrades of MSI packages, but then it fails in the middle, and during rollback, it uninstalls what it just installed, and then you're left with missing packages. So you have to repair so, the original bundle manually. Yeah, in yep. V3, you have to yep. go run the original bundle manually. Yep. But when I was trying to work on it here, like there might be multiple original bundles, and you don't know which ones have which packages. Multiple bundles could be upgraded. Yep. And when they all fall down. So when you end up rolling back an install, you don't know which upgrade packages were affected, which upgrade bundles were affected. So you end up having to install all of them. I think that's Which true. is a lot more work than we originally were Thought talking about. Yeah, I mean, typically there's only one. In the 90% case, probably, there's only one. Um, but there absolutely could be more than one. Is there a guaranteed order to upgrade bundles by version? I don't Sorry, two related bundles. The operation so. of related upgrade bundles. I don't think there's I think any. there's an open issue asking us to order the related bundles. Yeah. Yeah, there is. I don't remember that it was by version. Because, sorry, that where I'm going is, of course, you could pick the you know, highest version in your collection of related bundles and target that one by upgrade code, but there might be multiple. There, You can have multiple upgrade codes, so there'd be multiple bundles. Sure, sorry, I was, uh, the, the version of the detected, uh, the upgrade-related bundle 
pick the highest version of that set, regardless of upgrade code. You, oh, 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 I see, because this operation is going to happen during mm -hmm. the failure of the uninstall of the related bundle. Oof. Yeah, that would that would require you to collect all the related bundles and then pick an order. That's a little tougher. I'm not against just taking the highest version necessarily. For like, each upgrade code? No, just for one. Basically just and if there's two of them that are equal, pick one. It, essentially like I mean It's not, it would not be 100% perfect, right? Because you can concoct a situation <laughs> where you're upgrading multiple bundles and you roll back. So there's multiple bundles that you, that, and as you upgrade, you remove parts from each bundle or or only one, but it's the older version one. I mean, you can certainly create scenarios where we'll miss things, but the by far the largest and most common case is there's only one or you want to go back to the highest one. It's, it's, I mean, it's a weird situation if you have multiple of the same upgrade. It's an unusual situation to be upgrading multiple bundles at the same time. That That's a very unusual situation. I think you're right that, that you know 90% is a single upgraded bundle. Um, I think picking the highest version of all related bundles, even if the set is one, would get us up to 95 or yeah. so. I mean, pick the highest one because it's most likely to have the most set of packages or the most correct set of packages. So if we're going to put anything on the machine, let's put the most highest version thing. It might not even be the most recent. I mean, it could be completely wrong, right? Because you could like shift your versioning system and that's why you had to create different. But in the end for upgrades to work, your version has to be higher than theirs anyway. So I mean, chances are that's going to give you the right answer almost every time. And if it doesn't, then you have a pretty bonkers situation already. And you're, all, it's already going to be better than what we have today. And you won't be worse off, I don't think. You won't be worse off. And I think that keeps it sane in the engine. And solves the, probably the 95%, 98%, I mean, the most common case. Well, I mean, what I, running all of them is actually the simplest thing in the code. It'll take more work to single out one of them. Oh, I thought you said there's a problem running all of them. Is it just time? No, there's just a... Yeah, it's not it's not a code problem. It's a is that really a good thing to do problem? <laughs> uh, I thought the problem was um, that the system wasn't going to be happy running multiple of them. Um, is it a good thing? Well, wait, once once you've uninstalled any previous version, isn't it gone? Gone? We're not talking about uninstalling a bundle. We're talking about the chain in the middle of a chain, the install failed. So now it's got to go reinstall okay, all okay. the upgrade ability bundles. Right. The, the old versions. So, it has to reinstall the old versions that, were, that are still there because the new version failed. Got it. And if it's straightforward to do all of them, then I would just I'd probably do all of them <laughs> and just be like, all right, we're rolling back. Oh, couldn't roll back or we could have damaged this other thing. So let's run the, the, the repair on it. Now the trick is it's not a repair though, right? It's just an install. Yeah. It's an install. Yeah, right. The normal install operation. Yeah. Which hopefully is pretty quick. So should we, Order it 
from lowest version to highest version to try to emulate what probably happened where they installed the older ones first probably also i mean i think That's easy i think in that case i would and then at least then it's stable too right it's not gonna be well whatever order we read about the registry or something you, you know what i mean it's like then at least you'll get some consistency in the order they get put back on the machine. And that order seems the most useful, the most correct order, given all orders. Yep. And is there a new burn action? Uh, I forgot the, the thing that says, hey, you're being installed because of a rollback failure or anything. The, you know how we pass the burn like dot upgrade? Whenever we're doing upgrade, are yeah. we? Are you adding relation one? Type. Your relation type. Well, yeah, this is a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so, I was just passing upgrade like it normally does. Upgrade, but so it, it's upgrade. So now that's probably fine, right? So it's upgrade, but install instead of upgrade. Un normal is upgrade uninstall, which means you're being upgraded. Remove yourself. Now you could get an upgrade install, which is uh, the upgrade failed and you need to get yourself back on the machine. Yep. All right, that's fine. That will work just fine. Although as I'm learning when going through this code, like the BA can technically ask for an install of an upgrade at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We can't make we can't make things foolproof because, you know, et cetera. No, I think this is fine. I think this is fine. And then um, another problem that I've run into since then is if you're inside of a non-vital rollback boundary. Mm-hmm. So the failure happens inside of a non-vital rollback boundary. And then with, as the code is written right now, it'll roll back. It'll try to repair all the bundles during that, but then it'll keep on going. It'll skip to the end of that rollback boundary and then keep on oh. installing the chain. Because that's what's supposed to happen with the non-vital rollback boundary. But why are the... Okay, but why are the, I guess I would expect the bundles to be kicked off um, the upgrade installs to be kicked off at the very, very end one time, not in the middle. Is this only because of rollback boundaries that are getting kicked off in the middle? Well, before I fixed that bug with the non-vital rollback boundaries. It would have ended up, well, I'm trying to remember. I guess if it's, it's a more general question about non-vital because the, it used, the behavior used to be that it would basically just skip that non-vital package or the failed package and keep on going. Yeah. Even though it should not have kept on installing the rest of that rollback boundary. Right. So, so should we try to repair older bundles if a non-vital package fails? No, I don't. I don't. We should not try to repair older bundles if the new bundle is not being removed completely. It being rolled back all the way. Right. I think that makes sense. Because non-vital essentially allows you to get to a point, you're like, look, here's my new version. I get to this point, everything after this is non-vital. So I'm good with whatever I get, and I'll deal with anything that fails after this point, is, this, is the intent of it. So then it should remove the old versions at the end too. It's essentially successful. The bundle said, I'm good. This I'm I'm successful. Carry on. Yeah, I'll just have to make sure that that state is we have to remember that we rolled back. 
and then at the end of the chain, we'll have to do it. We'll have to execute these repair operations. Right. Yes, I agree. That's yes, I agree with that. That makes sense to me. But as we just discussed, it's not as simple as how, did we roll back or not. It's going to be like, did a package fail? Yeah, did we fail to install? And, and thus roll back? Are we removing ourselves? Correct. Yeah, you're right. It, it is. Is is the new is the new version? Was it upgrading anything? If so, is it failing and removing itself? And did it actually bought and, and ideally did it actually install something? Or roll back something? I mean, yeah, that's really what you want to know. Is like, did it roll back something, and is it rolling back all the way? Is the did the bundle roll back a package? And is the bundle rolling back fully itself? I think that's kind of the final statement. I don't know how hard it is to say that, but it's it's like that. Well, it's not really. Well, I guess it would have to roll back. But like a package has to fail, and it has to roll back, and. Sorry, you're removing yes. yourself. Yes, I, I assume rolling back a package means that the package failed. I don't. Yes. Yep. And that then the overall bundle is being failed, which means it's being removed. Yep. Yeah. And I don't think it's going to be that. There's going to be that common that multiple things are. Uh, multiple bundles are going to be installed again from there. I think it'll be all right. Cool. Anything else on this one, Sean? Oh, the the first commit. So right now it's sending in the detect related bundle what operation it's supposed to be. But as people have complained about, it actually depends on which action was initially given, like the operation depends on the action that's going to be taken. But during detect, we don't have an action. So like, I think it was that a downgrade is not reported unless we're trying to do an install. So like if, if the overall action, if you passed uninstall on the command line, you're never going to get told that a related bundle is a downgrade. Related bundle is a downgrade. It'll say related operation is none for the related bundle, even though that's a newer bundle that already exists on the machine. Mm -hmm. Don't we report it correctly during planning? The operation is not reported during planning. But we're uh, okay. uninstalling, so we're not going to do anything with that bundle. But people want the engine to tell them that that we're if we installed this current bundle, we'd be downgrading that existing bundle. So in uh, the commit, I moved okay. it from detect to plan. But since then, I've actually tempted to just remove it because it's redundant with the default request state. Sorry, I missed something there. It, it, you removed so, it. So the operation, the, the related operation is no longer part of the detect related bundle. And the commit, I moved it to when it's planning a related bundle, it'll tell you what the operation is. But really, that operation is redundant with the default request state when you're planning. Is the but state is, is going to be uninstalled, so you can deduce that it's a downgrade if you know the versions. Oh, I, but what about add-ons versus patches versus upgrades? 
Well, it was related operation, not relation type. Oh, oh, the related operation. So it was the related operation was like install, major upgrade, repair, uninstall, or downgrade. Yeah, major upgrade, downgrade. On a pack, and these are on packages? No, these are on bundles. Related bundles. The the related operation enum is shared with related bundles and MSI packages. Yeah, OK. Oh. That's odd. interesting. <laughs> OK, yes. So I'm thinking we should just remove that related operation with related bundles. Because it depends on the action that will be taken. And by the time you're planning, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's true. How do people detect downgrades today? A newer version well, of the bundle's already installed? The Wix BA looks at that downgrade related operation. But people have been saying that they've had to ignore that and just compare the versions themselves to detect the downgrade because they can't trust it because it depends on the action passed on the command line. Yeah. But the plan message has all the information. At plan time, there's enough information to give the correct value for our related operation. Yeah, but how do you do it to detect then? I mean, because there's a desire at the tech time you know, oh. to do this. Yeah, you so, don't want to get the plan to figure out that you're doing a your bundle's going to be downgrading another bundle. It's true, but really, so, there's no way to there is no way to tell without without the action. You have to compare the versions and yeah. relation type upgrade, and then compare the versions. Right. Yeah, that's, and you're provided I've done, the I've versions. done that in the past. And you're provided the versions. Checks. Yep. I see. Rather than having the burn engine calculate it for you. So I don't think it says upgrade uh, or downgrade detected during an uninstall because it's basically saying you're uninstalling. You can remove it. <laughs> so <laughs> like you don't want to block the uninstall because a newer version's installed. You're like, yeah, I know, something got busted. I want to get rid of this thing. You don't want it blocking, for example. But there's nothing stopping the BA from ignoring the uninstall on the command line and doing something else. But at the same time, there's no way for the BA to communicate to the engine what the action is to use during detect. That's correct. I guess we could, oh, that's interesting. So we have an action that you pass during plan. I guess and there's we, a global action. Yeah, which is what but, detect is based on. Detect uses that. I don't know. Yeah, detect is using the the action from the command. I see. Okay. And the command action is coming from the command line. And is it only using it for this case? For the the this related bundle operation, I think it was using it in a couple places earlier, but I've fixed them since. Yeah, it it shouldn't. I mean, obviously, in a full UI situation, the user hasn't chosen an action yet. Right. The you know you can make some assumptions, but yeah. So either they're, the, they're pretty weak. Yeah, either the if there's some reason that the bundle has to detect with a particular action in space in mind, then we need to provide it rather than use a global one. That makes sense to me. The better option would be for the detect to not require the global action at all. I agree, because it's it's if it's making decisions, that's not detection. You're already in, you know, the edges of planning. Yeah. So, yeah, this is the last place in detect that's looking at the action yeah, in okay. the command. Cool. Then then yeah, that's probably it. then yeah, you're right. 
the engine should not be using the global action, should not be using any action state during the tech, unless we have to, and if we do, then we have to think about it differently. Yeah. We have to pass the action in or something. Yep. Yeah, but but then you're back to the, you know, in a full UI situation, you don't know the action until yeah. after detect. Yeah, or detect. most likely you need detect, you need the results from detect. Yeah. Um before you can present any UI, yeah. much less choose an action. And in fact, we already have this uh, problem um, in in a couple of spots where it's not uncommon to need to run detect more than once because you need to gather some data from detect and then rerun detect to get some state in mind. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I agree. The not needing the global action and detect is a good thing. Okay. Good. That's it for this one then. All right. One more. Yeah. Two more. One more. What is it? Four eight five eight. Yeah. Or number sixty nine. Nice. Uninstall and size separately. Right. 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 So, so I guess here is where I want to talk about the security because that was the question. So the implementation I have here has it passing the product code to the elevated engine. And then the elevated engine will just uninstall that product code. Mm. Sounds right. Is a product, sorry, product code. Are you, does this, uh, what is it, action? No. Um, do, is the bundle author providing product code or upgrade code? Uh, I don't, in this particular implementation, the unelevated engine is only based on what it detected for the related MSIs. So and it uses upgrade it's, code to detect it, right? Yeah. But the issue is if you're just passing the product code across, then I mean that's that's kind of the level that I need to implement what's being asked. So the original right. yeah. person who created the issue wanted to specify a product code inside of an uninstall MSI package element. And at the same time, remember about a year ago, I removed a feature in the engine that was detecting orphaned compatible MSI packages and uninstalling an MSI on the machine if it had no more dependents. Oh. Yeah. So those two things are basically asking for the same thing pick a specific product code on the machine and uninstall it. Well, in in this case, though it it presumably is something that's explicitly authored and it doesn't give you any more functionality than you get today from running an MSI package that's authored to major upgrade a particular upgrade code. Right. This, the implementation I chose here has a different option in terms of what it's passing to the elevated engine to where the elevated engine could be more particular about what it actually uninstalls. But the, there's two other feature requests out there that need the more general thing of just passing product code. That's less, that feels to me is more specific. Passing the product code is more specific than using the upgrade code. Sure. But you, Sean, you're talking about the, the quote unquote backend implementation, not what the, um, yeah, what's off, what you can offer. Yeah, I'm just focusing on what the elevated engine accepts. Right. Accepts. So, 
in the end, the Elevate engine's going to need a product code to say, here, I'm removing this. So it, it boils down to the product code. The question is, uh, where does the if the product code comes from the UI side and the engine just trusts it, um, how much more do we have to do there? So to be really safe, the product codes could come from the UI side and then validated that they match the requirement on the elevation side, if that helped. It's essentially checked. Um, trust the UI's passing about and then check. Verify, not trust, or uh, there's a term here that I'm not pulling out of the air. Um, trust but verify, but I don't think that's quite right. So they pass, yeah, trust but verify. So they pass a product code in, the engine can be like, let me just double check that that meets the requirement, that that's in bounds, and then do the work. That's the extra level of check so that you don't have someone that jumps into the unelevated process and sends commands to the uh, elevator process to uninstall MSI packages. So the, the attack, if we just pass product codes from the UI side to the elevated side, the attack vector is something gets into the UI process and sends messages to the elevated side to say, hey, remove these MSIs. So an unelevated user could be using abusing burn to remove MSI packages from the machine. Right. Any MSI package. As right. opposed to its current ability to execute any XE via the elevated engine? Any XE? I don't think that's possible. Sorry, any... No, it, it only, uh, the elevated side should only execute things that it is in its manifest. And this detection of things uninstalled would be different because it would be passed, it would be trust, if it trusted the product code that came from the UI side. Um, okay. I mean, the feature I added that you can specify like a registry path in the manifest and then the engine will go to that registry path, read the key, and then run the path that's there. I think that's what Bob's talking about. No. Uh, no. No. Sorry. That would be HKLM, so I'm, I'm, about that. I'm, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding the vulnerability. Or, or the the vector here. Um, if are you suggesting are you suggesting malware getting to the elevated engine through the unelevated engine? No. Okay. I'm suggesting malware gets into the UI process and then sends messages to the elevator process to say, please uninstall this collection of product codes that I wish to have off the machine. Okay, that's what I was saying. Yes. Um, so they don't have to get into the elevator process, they just send messages to no. the elevator process. Okay. Through through the unelevated process. Through the unelevated process, right. Which okay. any, anybody could get into. Anybody on the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So I, I do not have the code directly in front of me. Are you saying that there is no way for the unelevated process today to ask it differently? Are you saying today the elevated process will only respond, will only execute an XE package that's in the manifest? Yes. The only thing the unelevated side passes to the elevated side is the parameters that you could pass that XE. But it cannot change the XE that gets launched. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, Otherwise, the burn engine is a, you know, could be used to launch any elevated XE, XE with the wrong UAC prompt up front, for example. Yeah, I oh, understand that. I'm, I'm struggling with the, uh, um, 
just my memory of, I guess, how the elevated process worked. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm I'm having trouble coming up with that validation, like Sean talked about for approved axes. Well, approved axes works because you have to write to a particular HKLM key. Exactly. And I'm having trouble understanding how we could provide that level of validation from... Uh, oh, the burn engine could take any... The UI could pass the product code to the engine, and the engine could just say, well, let me go see if this product code meets the product code list or upgrade code list that I know is allowed to be uninstalled. Essentially saying, is that product code within the set of things that the I've been entrusted to uninstall? Uh, okay, so you're saying the elevated engine would need to enumerate product codes for an upgrade code? Yeah, I don't remember if you can get the upgrade code from the product code directly of an installed machine. Get it directly. I mean, this, this is a very like how it does with the related bundles. So during when the when it starts supply, the unelevated engine tells the elevated engine that you know initialize for apply basically. And at that point, it enumerates all the related bundles. So then when the unelevated engine wants to run a related bundle elevated, it passes the ID, and then mm -hmm. the elevated engine has to go through the list that it enumerated yep. and find the one it picked. Yep. Same thing. Same thing. So we basically have to do the same thing for MSIs. We'd have to detect all the related MSIs or maybe do it on demand. I don't know. I agree. What you just said is the that will prevent arbitrary product codes from being passed from the UI side to the elevated side. And presumably you need to do it, I mean, you need to do it on the unelevated side to get the plan, right? So, right. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that, it's essentially you have to calculate all the product codes, and then when they get sent over the other side, have a list of things that on the elevated side it says, I've calculated what you could pass me. Is that inside this list, so or do it one another? I'm, I just don't remember if you can get the um, MSI. I'd have, I haven't looked for this MSI. I haven't looked for this MSI API. It'd be nice if there's an MSI API that you could say, "Give me the upgrade code given the product code." I don't think there's again a direct there, route. There, there's there, an indirect route. I mean, obviously, if you have product a product code, you can info. you know query its properties and get the upgrade code. It just, I don't think there's like a, you know, single API function to do that. Yeah, there's get product info, but I don't think that's up, that doesn't, that has the version, but doesn't have the upgrade right. code. Right. But it's something like that. <laughs> anyway. So Otherwise, you have to do the enumeration and things like that. I'm so. not sure what the check would be for that orphaned compatible MSI package. Like they might not be related at all in terms of upgrade code. Right. That I think was a was a a gap for the the whole forward compatible thing. Although oh, that data was also in a secure lo registry location. Yeah. So the check would be, look whether there's a dependency provider for that product code. But the dependency provider could not be hooked into the product code. It could be something different. Uh, yeah, I can't. I agree. I can't I, speak about dependency stuff without having the code right in front of me and then screaming and crying a little bit. So. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it could. I mean, I guess the unelevated engine could find it, so the elevated engine should be able to find it too. Yeah, I mean, it should, as long as there's no user context in the mix. But I, I don't remember that one well enough. Yeah. 
inside product info won't give you what you want. I was hoping. <laughs> I was hoping there was a quick way to say, this product code, what's its upgrade code? Is it in the list? Yes, carry on. But you might have to enum all products on a product, on a product, on a right, upgrade code, which I guess makes sense. It's a different query. Yeah. Anyway, yes. I don't have an answer for the second part about the what you want the forward compatible. But does that answer the security question? Yeah. As long as I can figure out a check for that one. Otherwise, I guess that feature is just going to not be possible. Where would you, how does the elevated side get the, the data from the manifest? It sends the package ID. So, sorry, the elevated side rereads the manifest? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, then, then... The feature is most useful anyway when we're talking about upgrade code. So we have to store the upgrade code in the manifest, and if the elevated side can reread it, then if it wants to process only a single product code, it just has to verify that you know that product code is in the set of related packages for that upgrade code, right? Correct. Exactly. Okay. Okay. It's essentially a trust list and the allow list. And the elevated engine has to rebuild to see what things it trusts from the unelevated side. Yep. So, so, sorry, I never, I never pictured. I think this was originally my issue. I never pictured this as being anything other than upgrade code. So, are you suggesting that we're going to rely on the normal detection of related packages and? send product codes across one at a time? So can we go to 4858? Yeah. The files changed? Oh, 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 what? the bug. Sorry. The, yeah, um, the issue itself. Yeah, yeah. Let me I can get there. Yeah, I didn't link it for some reason. Probably because it didn't actually implement what it was being asked. <laughs> okay. Yep, this so, is mine. So what are we going to turn this into? Like Uninstall an SI package. Do we need them to be able to specify any upgrade code? Or do they only want to uninstall related packages to an existing MSI package in the chain? No, I think it's any upgrade code. Yeah, so so I remember the scenario. Um, there there was this was a oh, I guess BA for a customer know. that had a bad package that didn't respond well to upgrades. So they wanted to uninstall the package. Um, and then install the new version, the new fixed stuff down. Um, doesn't have to be upgrade code. So the so so in my head, product code was sufficient. Um, but realistically, if you want to lock it down, then we we have to have upgrade code. No, um, no. We could upgrade it. That it's actually easier to lock down if it's product code. So it's whatever's in the manifest. Well, that's the only ones you can pass over. Right. Sorry. In my head, because um, I did not write a whip for this, uh, the BA, the BA could do the enumeration, but the BA cannot provide the product code. As I understand your security objection. I, I'm not worried about no, we can solve the security code with upgrade code and product code, both. Well either. Okay. Sorry, I'm saying if 
it's, it's not sufficient to only specify the product code as a static string. Right. So it could um, be. I mean, it sounds like you are asking no. for it sounds like you were asking for the BA to uninstall a package outside of the chain, just like as a no. method. No. 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 Just no. early in the chain. Before the MSI would before the MSI Correct. that would upgrade it, it's essentially saying, uh uh, you need to remove this MSI separate in its own transaction, do the thing before this MSI comes along, because when this MSI tries to upgrade it, bad things happen. Basically, yeah, the that. upgrade doesn't work. Because I they didn't just wasn't, it doesn't work. I just wasn't understanding why you thought you could specify one product code when you built the bundle and that would be it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, will, it would not be, sorry. That, again, I didn't go into detail here. Um, my assumption was that the BA would have a list of product codes that it needed, that it knew could not handle the upgrade. Upgrade code okay. itself would, would you're dealing with, this really, you know, edge case. There are a known number of versions of the product that uh, cannot successfully major upgrade. It, it's not even in this case. It wasn't even a, a you know a systemic thing. It was a particular version of a service or a driver or something could not stop or could not could not support restart or required a restart. I don't remember. Whatever. Um, it was it was a particular set of versions. Um, so one solution is to you know start over with a new upgrade code. It would be what I would recommend most likely. And then we could just say, yeah, any packages with upgrade code foo must be uninstalled at the beginning of the chain or wherever, just before the the new MSI. Um, in this case, there were a couple of versions specifically that they couldn't that could not handle the major upgrade. So upgrade code alone would not be sufficient. Um, if you want upgrade code for, ignore that. If I could provide a list of product codes, that would work. You could have I, multiple entries in the manifest, or in the chain. Yeah, Uninstall absolutely. these 30 product codes. And don't fail if you know um, if they don't exist. Well, of course. Um, I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, I, yes. I mean, based um, on what you're saying, you don't really want to specify an upgrade code. You just want to use the upgrade code that's in the package that's there, right? No, actually, in, in this situation, the suggestion was to change the upgrade code in the package to a new one, and then put to the avoid old the major upgrade up, problems. Exactly, so all of them. And then put the old upgrade code in burn, so the burn would remove all those old MSIs. And then this new MSI would come out, and it would fix all things going forward with a whole new upgrade code. Yeah. I mean, technically, you could have put the upgrade, the old one, in the upgrade table, and burn would use that as well, right? But burn no, doesn't do the uninstall. Would... Right. Right. No, but it this new burn... feature. Oh, could I see what you're saying. Look at any related. Uh, yeah, no, no, this isn't, no, <laughs> no, this is, this is, I, this is, I, in a bundle, I want to remove other things. This is explicitly a, a cleanup scenario. This is, this, <laughs> this is probably more like the, the, the forward compatible cleanup stuff, right? It says, in this case, it's, sufficient for it to be explicitly authored. Yeah, it, okay. it's, it's basically the same as remove file. During install, I want to remove a yeah. file. <laughs> Don't ask me why. Yeah. I just need to remove this file. Thank you. So this is the same thing. People are like, I have this MSI. During my bundle install, I need to remove this MSI. It's a problem. And then move forward. Now, this says you can detect by product code, which I think is definitely supported. The question is, does it also need to support upgrade code with version ranges and language ranges? Oh, God. Right, because it can't just be, it probably can't yeah. just be upgrade code, because you're like, yeah, right. new, I mean, maybe it can, but you're like, yeah, uninstall any MSI with this upgrade code. 
And the answer is probably going to be, no, not any of them, this range of them. That's going to be the most common case. Yep. Right? And in and this case, that would have required having the upgrade code and, you know, three or four different entries for the specific versions, non-overlapping version ranges that, that had this problem. So that's probably why when I open the bug, I open it and just said product code because in this case, that's that would have would have been sufficient. Yeah. It was sufficient. It's very, I mean, and it makes sense. You're like, I want to remove this file. I want to remove this package. Yeah. And the only thing then is how annoying is it <laughs> to have to do that? You might have a lot of packages that you <laughs> have to nuke. Yeah. Where an upgrade code would be easier, but also harder at the same time. If you get the versions wrong, then you're going to have burn removing its own stuff. Like, I mean, technically speaking, if you author it incorrectly, a repair yeah. of burn is going to turn around and like remove all of its stuff and then turn around and install it again. Oh God, you could, I mean, you could do that. That's just so. Oh no, <laughs> no, and, and this is this is why now that I'm I'm thinking back on it, you know, I'm actually fairly okay with restricting it to product code because you're absolutely if you author it wrong, you're messing up detect uh, and plan. Oh yeah, yeah, detection, yeah. So. You know, th this is a this is a case where where something you know laser focused on, yeah. Look, this product code does not share a related bundle. It's not going to be found. Just yeah, nuke it. Probably should do something to make sure that, that product code doesn't exist inside the chain too. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. what does planning do in that case, right? So you run detect. Right. If the thing's already installed, detect is there. You you go through plan, then it says, oh, it's here, so I need to uninstall the MSI package. But then later on, it's like, oh, now I need to install that same MSI package, but it's already checked on the machine, so it doesn't do that. And I right. think, I mean, we could teach Burn to be like, oh, well, you uninstall this, and then we come and modify the detect state while plan is running, essentially, to say, oh, now you're going to need this. And, and I think we should just be like, yeah, no, just don't freaking do that. <laughs> It will not. You can, this is not a mechanism to uninstall an MSI and install an MSI within the same bundle. Definitely not. Now that said, I, I think I'm fine. I live fine with that. I sleep fine with that yeah, limitation. Yeah. yeah. There, there, there's. I mean, there's a there's a spot. There's a space here, right? Because you know, you you see all the time on Wix users or Stack Overflow. Uh, oh my my MSI is broken. Um, you know, for X. It doesn't uninstall in certain circumstances, or whatever. Yeah. And you know, what's the answer? Well, you know, recache a fixed MSI or patch. That's true. The broken MSI. That's true. Um, so there's a space here. The, right. This, I think, was, you know, a more common case. And it's just, I, I'm very okay with the product code being the only entry because it just avoids a whole swath of problems. Yeah. So how does this interact with dependencies? If there's dependence on that package, should it not uninstall it? No, uh, it, should. it should. I think it should. And if they want to protect, I, the, I, I, yeah, they I think the it custom should. action should inside be, the MSI. There could be a there could be a force. Force equals yes to ignore. Uh, no, I no, no, no. I think it's I, kind of overkill. Yeah, uh, if you want it, then put the custom action inside the MSI that detects that it's being used by something else and silently act it successfully. Yeah. But if it was installed by a previous bundle, then there will be a dependent. But you definitely want to uninstall it. I mean, it, uh, if we don't make it an option, then I think it's fine to, you know, pass in the what is it? Ignore dependencies equals all. I mean, Burn does that for every single MSI package today. Oh, well, there we go. But that's because it does the dependency checking. Right. Yeah. The problem but is you're probably this is... in a situation where you, when you're using this, if it's in one of your previous bundles, you want to remove it. That feels like the most common case. This is this is a this is a cleanup thing. This is a you know yes 
I'm forcing this because the normal operations won't work. Yeah, yeah, I I think so. It's like remove file. You're like, yeah, we don't reference count check the file if you're saying remove file. You can remove a file that's reference count by some other component. If you do that, then you have to go repair that. <laughs> and you didn't mean that file, then you have to go repair it. The thing that was supposed to put it back. I mean, otherwise we end up with like all these options. Yeah, yeah. Ignore dependencies and stuff like that. I, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's it's easier to just ignore dependencies. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, I, that that's a little bit of a twinge for me, but not a serious one. Um, you know, that said, you know, maybe there is Again, there's a, there's a there's a space for remediation, and yeah, you know, I it definitely this feature definitely falls into that. Um, yeah, you know, if it means maybe we you know don't rush headlong into this feature, yeah, you know, I'm okay with that. It's obviously there yeah you know, there are workarounds to make this happen. Um, I mean, if it was a finite number. And packages, couldn't you just have put them in the chain and have install condition like zero equals one or something? Yeah, uh, yeah, but then you run into the problem of needing to create, you don't want to ship necessarily all these packages, especially if there's more than one. Um, oh, you, you want a remote it. payload from MSI package? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> no, this no, is. Remove this MSI. I don't even have it anymore. Make it go yeah, away. Yeah. No, this is yeah. This, I I I, I went down that route long enough to go. I would have to create, you know, an MSI package as small as possible to pretend that it's the packages we want removed, and it's doable because really, again, all you need to do is provide enough. You know, provided the, basically, you just need the product code for this. That's the only thing that it has to match. I felt a little dir dirty doing that. In the end, I used an XE package to make this happen. Yeah, I probably will not be doing this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I, I like I, I, I'm, I, I'm actually more intrigued about the idea of explicit remediation. Um, this, there, there's an area here of, of, yeah, there are some things we should do here to make, you know, remediation better. Well, I mean, we could add a property on MSI package that says uninstall before uh, install. Sure. And then sure. that skips all the weird detect things. That could happen. Mm -hmm. Uninstall before install. So if it detects uninstall any... related packages. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uninstall related packages. Okay. I was like, uninstall the MSI before installing. That's kind of harsh. Got it. Uninstall related packages. Basically, uh, let burn take care of it for you. Yeah. Nah. Nah. Yeah. Uh, that would mostly work. The the biggest downside is you'd have to you'd have to author the upgrade table correctly to do that and then you have an MSI that won't actually work because the upgrade table would you know tell it to try to do the major upgrade and that's what doesn't work in this case I'm also wor a little worried about how we overload the upgrade table already uh, but that's mostly fixed now All right. How about a feature to remove all unreferenced packages? A cleanup program. I don't know what unreferenced packages is. Remove all unreferenced packages. You mean everything that's not in the bundle? Remove all MSIs from the system that are not part of this bundle? <laughs> that, that could be extreme. <laughs> Might take a while. 
<laughs> Please wait while we uninstall everything off of your machine. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, yeah, I'm missing something there. But yeah, all right. Um, is that the end of the list, Sean? Yeah, that's it. All right. All right. So Mark is here. I don't know if he's still around. He wanted to talk about this a little bit. I don't know. Did he make the changes? And I didn't see them. No, this is still. So I don't know if there's anything we need to talk about. There's a lot of confusion about what the version command does and what the expectations are. So um, this is what happens when we had a, co a small conversation in here. If you're going to take an issue that's assigned to somebody else, you might leave a comment on there saying, hey, I'd like to take this issue so that you can get any of the context from that person. For example, I had a lot of context in how I was thinking this would be done. Um, and the important part here was to change the header. I'm trying to get a good shot of it. Yeah, to change the header of here where there was tool set core version this. Trying to get this in the header uh, to replace the previous header and to do so in a way that works in the Wix branding system um, so that all the headers have the full version the same way that MS Build now has its full version in it instead of right now it just says 4.0.0. Um, and then also I want to keep the version command because that's the simplest command in Wix that you can run and it will spit out the version in a flat thing so you can easily detect what version you have. You just run the command and say, here it is. It'll tell you what its version is. So that's the pur purpose of the version command. Is that an actual command or is it a yes. switch? No, it's a command. I think okay, it's a command. Cool. No, it's a switch. Sorry. No, it's a switch with no oh. command. I... I I don't know, it's been okay. so long. I need to get back in that code because there's a number of bugs I need to fix in there, but they're not right. the highest priority bugs to fix right now, so I will get back to them later. Anyway, yeah, it's it's here, I guess it's just a switch, but um, it's modeled after the .NET XE, and then MS Build has been going that similar direction, so it's kind of keeping those together, um, trying to meet, follow what they're doing. Um, and then, Bob, you brought up the whole concept of no logo by default, which would not print the header right. by default. And then you said something like, you don't want to do that? I got a little confused there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was trying to find your yeah, comment so in here. There, there, there was a comment uh, or an idea um, that no logo should be the default, mostly because, you know, we print three lines of, you know, tool name, version, and then a copyright. And yes. the copyright is, is useless. No one needs to see that in their log. Um, the version is still useful. So... I don't want to drop that, but I had it was just an idea of, of you know well we could pick a middle ground yeah. and not print the copyright statement, um, but still provide the version, which seemed like what they were kind of getting to with MS Build maybe because nobody it seemed like right. a lot yeah. of people on MS Build had the same concern you did they wanted the version to be printed, right? I think it's mo it's kind of interesting because like I just did a change to try to turn off the version being you know, printed constantly because it was just, all the output was hiding the things I was actually looking for um, when there's right. lots and lots of builds. Um, but it, the funny thing is that I want the header in Wix for the same reason they want the header. I want to get a log file yeah. from somebody and have the version in there so I can look at it and go, oh, yeah, that one has that bug. Uh, upgrade. <laughs> right. So yep. I, I, I get that. The, and the copyright, again, I, we did it because we're modeling them. So if they dropped it, yeah, we should drop it. I drop it in heartbeat. Um, anyway, so that's what this one's all about, just trying to get there. But I think I gave enough comments on the end. Yeah, and he, Mark hasn't come back, so I'll let him digest that a little bit and see if that worked. And then, Ron, Wait, I, I have no idea what's that, going on in your branch. Your that's said pending. I don't think you sent that. What? That comment? It said pending. Waiting for Mark to resolve it. I hope this is in the UI. Pending. I think that says that the review is pending. I hope that's what it says. No, I don't. I didn't see those. Well, then how do I? <laughs> Go to the files changed. Do I have to submit my review changes? Oh, yeah. I don't see them either. Oh, my um, gosh. What is why... interesting <laughs> UI. That's why he's confused. Here I was thinking that, I, oh, my bad, Mark. I don't know how to use the GitHub UI, but yeah, so there we go. Wow, 
that's just been sitting there waiting then. So when you start a review, you have to submit it before your comments show up. Okay. That is not the way Azure DevOps works, which is where we do most of our stuff at FireJoint. So lovely. Um, yeah, because it, it doesn't know how many comments you're going to add. So yeah. if you, yeah, if you want to do multiple comments in one, you have to tell it when you're done. I guess. Again, in Azure DevOps, the comments just show up <laughs> as you add them, and they're just there. Um, so, all right. Well, there we go. Now I have more comments on that. And I've just walked through what I was trying to explain. Okay, cool. It's light blue. I've been in dark mode for so long. I'm, this light blue is interesting. All right. And that leaves us with, where am I going? Back, 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 back. Pull requests. Issue this. Yeah, and this had lots of, oh, no, this is not the same thing. Oh, this is not what I thought it was. All right, I haven't even looked at it yet. That's, oh, no, Bob has looked at it. All right. Cool. So we're making progress on things. Let's go drop back and um, continue to move on. So just a quick reminder, there's no new information here, nothing to say. Uh, we're moving to YouTube in two weeks. So, well, meeting in two weeks, assuming. Uh, next meeting will be on YouTube next year. Uh, it will be on YouTube instead of Twitch. Not many other changes after that. Uh, anything else people want to talk about? Stuff going on, things happening. Uh, stuff should be aware of. While you guys think about I that, question. Uh -huh. I have a question. If no one else does, mm -hmm. can you take a look at issue six 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 nine? Ooh, six 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 nine. So, I went to fix this in preparation for updating Burn uh, to handle bundle registration in both 64 and 32-bit registry highs, um, which it turns out you don't, this isn't actually a prerequisite. It's extremely straightforward to, to you know, pass the right flag to get 32-bit registry keys. Um, I do want them, I do want RedJoodle to have explicit support because it already kind of does, as I mentioned in this issue. Um, however, it came upon an amusing issue, mildly amusing. Um, the functions that need support for, you know, to force a 32-bit registry key, um, the delete function, regularly already supports it, um, but the create and open functions do not. So I went in there and I added reg open EX to add the, the switch, and it was great. And then I went to do that for create, and Oh, look, we already have regcreate EX. What do we call the third reg cre registry creation function in RegJudal? We have regcreate, we have regcreate EX. Is the third one regcreate EX2 or something else? don't know. Do we take a major version number and break it? We could do that. How bad is that? It's adding a parameter? Yeah, yeah. Reg create EX, EX seems kind of funny. Reg create EX, EX? No, that's oh, like terrible. Uh, I'd almost take the break. I assume reg create. Yeah, is there a reg create? Is there a what's the real one? Um, create register key ex in Win32. Oh, um, at least yeah. <laughs> Great registry key EX. I'd almost be surprised if they didn't have the same problem. Yeah. 
I guess I don't know how bad the break is. I don't know. Well, we haven't we haven't done it. We haven't broken anything in Diesel yes. in Night Four. No, we did. Well, uh, no, the I size, the mutal. size, and theme mutal, and then the size stuff isn't that going to break people? Um, yeah, yeah, it could. Yeah, that's true. Well, that would argue toward, you know, cleaning up. Yeah, I think that's there are, you know, the the ex functions could go away. Some of them. Yeah, I. Some of them, right? Some of them add functionality that you only want, and like they truly are ex. They're like extra functions. They're like, here's the simple one, and here's the the harder one. The harder one gives you yeah. more functionality than the simple one. Have a nice day. Um, otherwise, I think it's ex two, but I'm not a hundred. I'm not against the break either on the major version. Yeah. On the major version. Okay, I'll I'll see which way the wind blows. Sean, do you have any preference? I was trying to get an idea of how much we use each one. I got roughly thirty-seven hits for the normal one, and haven't Probably been able two. to search for the thirty-seven. For no, the original for Rich one? Crate, Rich Crate EX. Yeah, it yeah, takes I, a lot of search. <laughs> well, especially if you haven't deleted the 5 gig file. I found that out. <laughs> <laughs> this is a simple grep across the tree. What is... Oh, right. But it's a zero by um, file, isn't it? <laughs> what extension huh? did I give that? Can't you just skip that one? I could, but I never remember. I suppose... I should have a you know little script to my grepping for Wix. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, it's dot file. ex. Yeah, that's not, five yeah. gb dot file. But I want to search all files. Uh, I'm pretty sure reg create ex was <laughs> was added specifically for burn because it adds support for volatile keys that I have since taken. <laughs> So it wouldn't surprise uh, me if there was like one reference in all of the Wix code. It's just deputal and registration, okay. which you removed. Yep. Yep. So yeah, just uh, change the X function because there's only deputal using it. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to be said for for that. We can we <laughs> we can feel free to break the ex functions because. Their extra functionality, and therefore you're fine fixing breaks. Yeah. Cool. At least in a major upgrade. Okay, that's probably the route I will go. All right. So I think, that according to the calendar, if I can read it correctly, always a challenge. We meet again in January 13th of 2022. Does that sound right? And um, on YouTube. So two weeks from now. Come on back. We will see how the world is progressing around us. Um, and hopefully more things will work in Wix 4, because that's where I'm spending most of my time. Barring any other last-minute, last-second questions here. Okay. Two weeks. January 13th, 2022, on YouTube. We'll see all you guys there, 9.30 Pacific. Until then, you guys have a good time. I'm going to go start shoveling some snow. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.